You're listening to The Pithy Chronicle. History with a bite. I'm Caroline. And I'm Erica. And we bring you history's dirtiest deeds dripping with sarcasm. Are you hungry yet? All right. Erica and I are on the naughty list. So naughty. Things have gone awry. To our pathetic little credit, we have been incredibly sick. I didn't have a voice for two and a half weeks, so that really did make recording impossible. And then there's been perforated eardrums for little miss over there. Uh Uh-huh. Just complete chaos. Honestly, it has been the most, and I blame you, obviously. Obviously. The most Murphy's Law Christmas ever. Yes. Yeah. So we're really sorry. We're behind. This script was written more than a month ago, (laughs) but unfortunately, just a blizzard of incidents has made this very challenging. So here we are, and we're going (laughs) to tell you today about another amazing woman who did not go on crusade, but whose, I'm going to say like pig-headedness killed her husband to make sure he went. Was it pig-headedness, or is she like our Taylor Swift level mastermind? I, I can't, I can't specify which it is. Yet. I got, a, I got a comment from a listener saying, you guys talk about Taylor Swift a lot. I'm sorry. She is only the most iconic musician of our generation. And not only that, she's an excellent businesswoman. So I'm sorry. She's so iconic. So my favorite Question part is that mark? because they complained, we've had this conversation and now she features more. <laughs> so after today, we are going to take that much needed break to regroup. And we are going to be doing something special for Valentine's Day. Oh, yeah. We're going to be looking at Eleanor of Aquitaine. She is the lion in winter, and oh my gosh, her love life is one of the most debated, contested, discussed, and worth it. It's juicy. So we are bringing you all of the relationship tidbits from the crusade a la Eleanor of Aquitaine. We hope everyone has a magical holiday season, a really good new year, and we have made our resolutions to get our butts back on track. Mine's to have a cocktail once a week. I already do that. (laughs) I'm Caroline, and that would be the delightful Erica. Miss, I'm gonna have a cocktail a week. Today, I'm gonna be telling the captivating story of Adela of Blois. Ooh. The ultimate Kevin Bacon. Because she's footloose and fancy free and dances out her frustration? Wow, that was not where I was going with that. No, as in six degrees of. Oh, okay. Because Adela was related to everyone. Yeah, she was. And that's what we're going to talk about a lot today. She has relatives in every single season of our podcast. I did the look back. That's not to say that our histories are the most important ones. But it does mean that she's uber well-connected and ass-kickingly awesome. I think we have a particular flair for the relevant and interesting, so maybe it is the most important. But who am I to say? Well, like us, she's a woman who knew what she wanted. Mm -hmm. And then she just flippin' took it. Religious and motivated, this lady kicked her husband out the door, not once but twice, on a quest to the Holy Land. Oh! And then she ruled in his stead like a true crusading queen. So housekeeping. Housekeeping. Something that I'm sure our Adela knew absolutely nothing about. Oh, what a dream. Yeah. As always, we are on wherever you find your podcast. Please look down. Give us a five-star rating. Write us a little review. It does not have to be eloquent, loquacious, or anything of the sort. But loquacious... If you refer to us as such, we'd be thrilled. I wouldn't mind that. But it does not have to be grand. It just has to be there. (laughs) God, that could apply to so many things. Oh, that is very Adela. (laughs) You don't have to do a great job on the crusade. You just have to go. Just go. Adela was born somewhere between 1066 and 1070. Kind of a circa baby, but not really. Yeah, we don't have an exact date, but we do know that she was born after her father conquered England. Because well, what a hair flip on that one. Hair, after he just took over that small little island there. Adela, Miss I'm Related to Everyone, was the youngest daughter of William the Conqueror. 
Oh, I love it when we talk about Billy the Cop. I know. Also, her mom, therefore, was Matilda of Flanders. I also love her. She is yeah. an incredible character and a force to be reckoned with. But that is another season for another time. Well, but I do think she she just isn't always getting the hype and the interest and in, in the scandal that she deserves. Oh my God, and she really was scandalous. Mm -hmm. Rumor has it Matilda had quite the romantic history. They swirled about her love interest, including the English ambassador and the Anglo-Saxon thane, Britrick, son of Algar. She went after him and proposed and he denied her and paid a steep price for it, ultimately meeting his demise. She really put herself out there for Billy the Conk as well. Girl, she did. Which, when you are as royal as she is and she- I mean, she, she bled purple. Think about Victoria. Queen Victoria had to ask Albert to right. marry her. Yeah. I won't say it's a similar situation, but there wasn't really anyone who could compete with her royalness. So, of course, William tried, but scandalously, Matilda refused to marry the Norman Duke at the time, William the Bastard, who would become Billy the Conk. So he sent a representative who proposed to her, and in oh, a fit yes. of snobbery, she declared herself too highborn to marry, to marry a, a bastard. bastard. Enraged, William then rode to Bruges, where he dramatically yanked Matilda off her horse by her braids, tossed her in the mud, and galloped away. And that is what made her agree to marry him, despite a papal ban that refused to bless their union because they were pretty heavily related. I guess love can just really conquer even the muddiest of beginnings. But you know what? If that's your thing, go on for <laughs> it. <laughs> and so that's the life to which Adela was born. She was born to be King of England and the Duke of Normandy, not to mention the Flanders side of yeah. things. And she was soon to be King Henry I of England's favorite sister. Adela was high-spirited. She was educated with a knowledge of Latin, very unusual for women at the time. Her accomplished parents spent much of their time on horseback, tending to their Norman holdings and the newly taken English Isle, so she spent a lot of time in convents where her moral and educational tutoring happened. Her monastic schooling likely contributed to high religious fervor. She had three older brothers and one younger, so she was really never in danger of inheriting. But she had something almost as valuable as a crown, a bloodline that wouldn't quit. If you got it flaunted? I mean, I think she did. She was like, look, everybody I'm related to is really important, so you should marry me, and then you'll be important. She married Stephen Henry, the heir to the Count of Blois. B-L-O-I-S. Blois. Literally Caroline's favorite word. She was about 15. When she got married. That's good for mm. this day and age. Their union was a powerful familial alliance that linked two of the most influential families in Northern Europe. Because, of course, even though we think of Billy the Conk as connected to England, he was the Duke of Normandy first and foremost. Almost always even in his own mind, I think. And so they were French. Yeah. It wasn't until the Tudors that they stopped speaking exclusively French. Even the Tudors spoke a lot of French. I think Elizabeth was kind yeah. of the one who was... We're going to go English. Let's go more English. So for 600 years, they spoke French. Exclusively British French. French. Yeah. It's very Russian mm -hmm. of them. It is very Russian so of them. So Stephen as we probably all expected, was not 15. He was about 20 years her senior. A classically creepy age gap. But it is believed that Adela and Stephen had a genuine relationship based at least on trust and mutual respect, if not a ton of physical affection. Uh, didn't they have a brood of kids? Well, yeah, but I mean, Adela was a proper medieval wife. She knew her duties. Well, they had <laughs> so long. They had between six and eight children, and there's a bit of question about how many daughters and whether or not maybe they were from Stephen's previous liaisons and were kind of adopted. We're not quite sure. Well, I would want him to go to crusade too. Well, those were from prior to the marriage. Yeah, exactly. That's a big ask. 
That I'm is sorry. A big I fooled around before you. Please raise my liaisons, children. Well, especially yeah. since this girl was 15 years old. She's like, I'm not going to raise a nine-year-old. And one of the literally most royal people ever. I could see how she would think that's beneath her. I don't know. I mean, she seems like she did it fine. Yeah. So Stephen inherited Blois, Chartres, and Mieux upon his dad's death in 1089. He also received the lands and rights of Barry and Burgundy. There were also lands east of Paris, and by the end of Adela's life, the collected regions were kind of coalescing into what became the county of Champagne, a fitting name for a princess of England and countess of the soon-to-be France. Nice. Adela was an incredibly involved countess. During Stephen's absence on the First Crusade, Adela filled in as regent not once, but twice. She issued charters, granted monks the right to build new churches, and even bound both herself and her husband to protect the Bishop of Chartres, who was disputing with the King of France at the time. Who said medieval women couldn't do it all? Um, Oprah calls it multitasking. So. Oh my god. Oprah. Oprah. So, many women were left behind while their husband took the cross, and a lot of them did have extraordinary power for the time, taking on the roles of their male counterparts, and Adela embraced it with determination. Stephen's letters to Adela give us a very unique insight into the experience of the Crusades leaders, and they also show us how he trusted her to rule as regent when he was gone. We also have Adela's correspondence with Ivo, the Bishop of Chartres, where she discusses matters like controlling those pesky, misbehaving nuns who kind of seem to be less than happy with their nunnery life than Adela thought they should be, but, you know. Fascinating. She was like, why can't they just be happy that they're sitting there all by themselves in the dark and quiet? Well, and at this point, weren't they still doing the thing where they would brick them into these... Anchorites. Yes. Literally bricked them in like for a life, cask of Amontillado. With like a tiny little yeah. place for food. Um, yes, yes, I think that was still happening to some extent. I don't think that Adela was pushing for that by any means. But, I mean, the nuns easily could have also just been complaining about sexual harassment. I mean, it's hard to say. Which is valid. valid. <laughs> Adela wasn't thrilled, and she took care of it. She was also incredibly political, and her prestigious pedigree probably gave her the confidence to act a lot on her own initiative. While Stephen was gone, Adela continued to tour their extensive lands, settling disputes, promoting economic growth, and even commanding knights to go into battle with the king. So tell me a little bit more about Stephen's crusading adventure. I mean, it, it's a little pathetic. Well, I just want to know if he's like his very disappointing son, the future king of England. Let's find out. Stephen joined the First Crusade in 1096, along with his brother-in-law, Robert Kurt Hose, who was Adela's eldest brother. And very short. And very short. Embarrassingly, Stephen actually abandoned the First Crusade in 1100, tucked his tail between his legs, returning to France. I cannot imagine that the daughter of Billy the Conqueror was very cool with an unconquering husband. Oh, no. She had zero sympathy for the miseries of Stephen's four-year expedition to the Holy Land. Jeez, man. He gets home, and she's like, what the heck are you doing here? She ignored his complaints about a lack of organization and planning, which were completely valid. And she didn't seem to notice when he claimed that more lives were lost than saved due to food shortages and Turkish raids. She was just like, "Mm, sounds like you're a bit of a whiny pants. Yeah. She was likely a bit more excited about the cartloads of jewels and maps and treasures which he deposited at Chartres, likely at Adela's urging because she was quite religious. But, I mean, he did bring back the booty. Mm -hmm. However, it is widely reported that Adela constantly berated him for his cowardice, even during sex, and continually urged him to return to the Holy Land. Okay, 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 okay. She was discussing this during the act or instead of the act? Because those are very different things, and I cannot imagine during. I th- Yeah, it would certainly make it harder for him to perform, I would think. Especially since he was so unconquering. Yeah. Don't you want to 
stop the unconquering on both fronts, Adela? (laughs) There are some sources that claim that she withheld his husbandly privileges until he agreed to return to Jerusalem. Or actually really just get all the way there for the first time because he never made it. Yeah. Adela's particular brand of persuasion proved very popular with historians like us, trying to understand the motivations of crusaders because her religious zeal kind of translated into his taking of the cross. That's a real power move. She must have had Anna Comena strength in that badge of hers. Oh, I know. Uh, At least she didn't break it off like Anna Comena. Well, they did conceive a child during this interlude between the First Crusade and his eventual return to Crusade, where he ended up joining what would become the Faint-Hearted Crusade. Mm. Not a good omen. No. But once the baby was born, off Stephen went in 1101. And like the many Crusades nickname, Stephen wasn't exactly gung-ho about this. He was kind of faint-hearted. And based on his quick demise, he was likely prophetic. Killed after the Battle of Ramla, Stephen was no more. And Adela was happy to continue her role as regent, which she maintained until her son, Theobald, was of age. Dedication. Even after Theobald no longer needed a regent, Adela continued to issue charters and generally act as a co-ruler of many parts of their land. Hmm. She also never secured a marriage for poor Theobald, who was already plagued with a weird-ass name. Theobald is not great, but it is better than Ermengird. <laughs> Every time. Ermengird. Every time. But Theobald <laughs> just makes me think, are you bald yet? Mm. But Theobald did not actually marry until after his mother dearest's retirement. So it's pretty clear that she did not want an interfering daughter-in-law taking her power and influence and jewels and you know, apartments. Oh, Adela, don't be that person. Oh, but she was. Don't be that mother-in-law. Everybody's that mother-in-law. As we've discussed, Adela was deeply devout. Of Benedictine sympathies, she ensured that her children's upbringings reflected her own values. The Benedictines were a contemplative monastic order for men and women who followed the rule of St. Benedict. In a book of monastic precepts, circa the year 530, St. Benedict of Nursia laid out a communal living for monks following an authoritative abbot. Adela did like to have someone be in charge, specifically herself. Oh, I can't imagine who. And Adela was all in. In fact, she actually dedicated her youngest son, Henry, the kid conceived between Crusades 1 and 1 and a half, to the service of God when he was just two years old. She pledged him to the church at Clooney Abbey as an oblate child. All right, give me the definition for an oblate child, because it sounds like he just has a really, really bad case of bloating. (laughs) It was a medieval practice. Like bloating. It meant that that he belonged (laughs) to the church. He was (laughs) to the bloated (laughs) abbot responsible for the church. (laughs) Educated in the monastery, he would go on to actually become the abbot of Glastonbury and the Bishop of Winchester, where he sponsored numerous constructions, abbeys, and chapels, and he even sponsored the treasured Winchester Bible. Wait, is this that Bishop of Winchester? (gasps) It's that guy. Oh my gosh. Well, look at him. Quite the little overachiever. Like mother, like oblate child, I guess. Adela was certainly incredibly proud of her youngest kid. Was he the favorite, do you think? Yeah, because William, the eldest, was a bit of a disappointment. Despite his previously being named heir designate, she replaced him with his younger brother, the future Count Theobald. Oh my, that's spicy. You don't see that a whole heck of a Mm -hmm, lot. mm -hmm. I mean, tell me, spill the tea. So, Adela was pro the Bishop of Chartres and anti-King of France in a specific dispute that we're not going to bother with right now. No. (laughs) They were having an issue and she had a very pointed opinion. Mm -hmm. However, William, the eldest son, did not mimic his mom's opinions. He literally burst into the cathedral and demanded that the burghers, the wealthy citizens of Chartres, swear an oath 
in church to kill the canons or church leaders, harass Ivo of Chartres, the mom's bishop BFF, and secure Episcopal lands. That is... It was aggressive. That's a lot. William was quickly removed from his duties, and when son number two reached majority around 1107, Adela made him the Count of Blois Chartres. Well, what happened to non-mama's boy, William? He retired to his wife's lands in Sully, which is in the Loire region of France, where he seemingly was pretty cool with the situation and supported his brother, Theo. He probably was just glad to get away from mom, but I mean, that seems like a very early retirement from not having a job ever. Well, I think a lot of them really enjoyed the not having a job aspect. Adela was a force to be reckoned with, which makes sense. It runs in the family, or at least for some of them. Another son, Stephen, who we've kind of brought up, named for his blah dad, moved to London in 1111 to join his uncle, King Henry's court. He quickly became a favorite, and when Henry died without a male heir... Stephen was ready and waiting. He's like, this is my moment. And thus began the protracted English Civil War that lasted 20 years. In the end, Stephen kept the crown, beating out Henry's daughter, Matilda. But Stephen's kids were out on their butts, and Matilda's son, Henry, ascended the throne upon Stephen's death. And if you want to get in the nitty-nitty gritty of that, please go back to Women at War, our last season, Mm -hmm. and check out Mm -hmm. The War of the Matildas. They are two really formidable women. It's really really interesting. And of course, Matilda, daughter of King Henry, is fighting against Stephen, her cousin. But she actually spent a lot of time in France where Adela is, which would have been the mom of Stephen. Mm -hmm. It's a very complicated relationship with all of these incredibly powerful women kind of pushing for the men in their lives to do the thing that they want them to do. It's all gender politics and power struggles. What is it from my big fat Greek wedding? The man may be the head of the family, but the woman is the neck. Yeah. And she can turn the head. Wherever she wants. she wants. I love that quote. Eventually, Adela retired to the Marcini convent in 1120 prestigious and powerful. It was a better fit than the Norman Abbey where many sisters and nieces of Adela were already living. I mean, she just needed the power, not the company. While conveniently located near her son, Henry, it also allowed her to continue advising her children. And it continued her relationship with Chartres ecclesiastical leaders. And so she maintained a very lasting influence until her passing in 1137. Advising? What do you mean by that? For instance, she wrote a long letter to both her son, the Count, and Geoffrey, the current Bishop of Chartres, reminding them of how she had always given extensive ties to the church. So mom guilt was a strong one with her. And the Holy Spirit. Yeah, yeah. She was a Catholic saint, in fact. Her feast day, in case you were wondering, is February 24th. Mm-hmm. Coming right up. Her devout nature and support for scholars and poets, along with her generous endowments to abbeys and churches, helped expand and preserve the culture and art of her time. That's the official line. But it really was her money, influence, and retirement to the convent that propelled Adela to sainthood. That is so fascinating. She didn't go on crusade. But one could argue, and I would like to, that she was the driving force behind Stephen's crusade. Does that count? I'm not sure. But while he may have run away, he still supported and enriched the crusading movement, supplying troops and supplies. And whether or not he was sexually compelled to return, he did go back and died in battle, quote, for Jerusalem. Even if sure she wasn't on the road and she wasn't fighting obviously he brought back a lot of i'm i'm gonna call it loot because you know he didn't buy it he he didn't buy that but she did take steps to ensure that education was there even if it was just for the elite but i i think that is something that we don't always think about preserving and how important that is uh, until you're affected by it firsthand. Also, that loot that came back went to the cathedral. The it church, did not right? stay in the castle or whatever their abode was. Mm-hmm. It went to the church. So she was certainly 
religiously crusading, even if she wasn't physically crusading. Oh, I completely agree on that. But I, I want to know what you think she was crusading for, or, or maybe you disagree and you say that she doesn't belong in this series. And- mm-hmm. That's a good question. She is not a crusader in the way that we have approached it yet, but I still think she is. I still think the religious fervor counts. And I also think that the fact that she had to manage the massive swath of land that she did. Yeah, it was quite an undertaking. Yeah, that still makes her, in my opinion, a queen. She's ruling and she's doing it because of the crusade. I think she probably sent her husband away. I think... She probably did. I think she was like, hey, there's this thing where everybody's going to Jerusalem. Four years. I mean, four years is a long time to be by yourself. And you get pretty damn accustomed to doing things the way you want to. I can imagine that if she finally got a taste of that freedom and the power of being the one in charge, the de facto ruler, that having him come back that is going to brush up and and chase yeah, yeah. real hard on those freedoms. So it would not surprise me if she was like, you know what? You were gone for four years. I hadn't heard hide nor hair from you. No, they had. They'd alive. written these enormous letters back and forth. Really? Stephen's letters back and forth to Adela tell us so much about the misery of the campaign and the lack of organization. He complained bitterly. He's like, nobody's in charge. Who am I supposed to answer to? How are we supposed to get there? Who's going to feed the troops? This is a question I would love to hear about. He was complaining, and we characterize it as complaining. He's he's whinging. He's being a weenie about it. But he obviously was right. So should we really be giving him this hard of a time? That's very fair. Stephen was perhaps more astute, maybe more pragmatic is the right word. He's like, guys, this just doesn't seem like a good plan. Like, I'm here. My wife kicked me out on my ass and told me to go move it to Jerusalem, but I don't understand the point. He's probably like, I have had these direct orders from my wife, and no one is giving me direct orders here. So what am I to do with that? I am used to us. I just need someone to tell me what to do touristic environment with my wife at home and you're not serving it man you're not that is awesome you're you're not filling her shoes here (laughs) i think that adela's story is an untold often aspect of the crusades it was not just the men and obviously the women that left but they left something behind and the people that were left behind had to pick up their lives and keep going make movements it also talks about the fact that There was communication between Mm -hmm. the campaign and the people left behind. People were more up to date on what was happening than perhaps we might think. And most importantly, she's just such a force. So you just can't imagine that she wouldn't get her way in something like this. We're seeing a lot more in the zeitgeist of the era that we live in now of acknowledging invisible labor. And Hmm. obviously this is not the same type of invisible labor, but we think about being on crusade as being in the mud of it, in the thick of it, on the actual trail, these things that we've built up to mythic proportion. And we've kind of ignored those who are left behind. And even though they are doing this meaningful, powerful work that will affect generations far down the road, we don't think of that as crusade crusade because we think of it as something else. You're not acknowledging the invisible workings and the invisible machinations, political or otherwise, of the power struggles. And I think that's what makes Adela really interesting. She exercises her power in a way, I mean, it is obvious, but it is not- But yet subtle. It's not in the way that, for instance, her niece, Matilda, Empress Matilda, it's not a masculine mm-hmm. way. She still mm-hmm. exercises a feminine type of power like we saw in Matilda of Boulogne's case, rather than exuding a masculine energy that you know was yeah. so affrontive just a few decades later in the English Civil Wars. I like the idea of invisible labor, especially at this time of year, because it is all about giving back and Mm. being thankful and showing charity in your own way shape or form so we hope that you are able in some way Mm -hmm. to give back and partake with your family and friends during this season and we will see you or at least talk to you (laughs) in the new year i'm caroline and i'm erica and we are pithily yours
This episode is brought to you by the Pithy Chronicle, LLC. The Pithy Chronicle is intended for education, entertainment, and non-commercial purposes. Any views or opinions expressed in this podcast are personal and do not represent those of people, institutions, or organizations that the owner may or may not be associated with in a professional or personal capacity. While we offer lots of sarcasm, this podcast does not offer any advice or services. Listening to this podcast may induce fits of laughter, unexpected distraction, or uncontrollable rage at the subjects. Hopefully not at us. We hope you learned something today. If not, so sorry. Please be advised we are not experts in the following fields. Medical, legal, financial, technological, thermonuclear engineering, submarine warfare, neuroscience, or cat husbandry. Thanks for listening to our little disclaimer. Just covering our history-loving asses. Bye!